Hello and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Coming up a little bit later in the show, we'll hear a musical selection from the John Peterson Quintet. But first, joining us now is Dr. David Gruwell, uh, the chair of the Professor of Industrial and Manufacturing Engineering Department at uh, NDSU. Uh, Dr. Gruwell, thanks for joining us today. Well, I appreciate you having me this morning. Well, as we get started, tell the folks a little bit about yourself and your background, maybe where you're originally from. Okay, originally I uh, grew up in Ohio. I uh, grew up on a small farm and, and went to Ohio State and got a bachelor's in welding engineering, of all things. Uh, studied polymers uh, as a welding engineering student and then went off and worked at Emerson Electric uh, for about uh, 12 to 14 years. And then Emerson was nice enough to uh, pay for my PhD, MS and PhD back at Ohio State. And uh, again, I studied uh, polymer welding, plastics welding. Uh, and then I uh, spent about 14 years down at Iowa State in the Department of Agricultural and Biosystem Engineering. Um, and uh, worked my way through the ranks of uh, associate, C assistant associate professor. Uh, then I joined uh, NDSU about uh, 14 months ago. Oh, well, welcome. Thank you. Uh, well, let's talk about NDSU. Uh, they've been named as a lead site for a big research study uh, on bioplastics. Mm -hmm. What can you tell us about that? So uh, it started a number of years ago, uh, probably about closer to 10 years ago uh, when I was at Iowa State with uh, the current dean of the College of Engineering here at, at an NDSU, and that's Mike Kessler. And uh, we started together and we uh, took over a program um, that uh, was focused on sustainable materials, the BBRT or Bioplastics Biocomposites Research Team. And coming from industry, I realized that we were missing some opportunities of engaging industry. And so we started to go out and engaging industry in terms of going to trade shows, uh, working with industry uh, in terms of research projects. And then an opportunity came up uh, to submit a proposal to form an IUCRC with the National Science Foundation Center. And an IUCRC is a industry university cooperative research center. And so at that time, then Mike uh, had moved on to Washington State as the department chair. And uh, so I reached out to Mike and we put together a very long proposal, submitted that to NSF um, and went through a lot of hurdles and, and pulled it off and, and got a center formed with Iowa State and Washington State. Um, since then and over the last uh, 12 months, we have doubled in size and went from two sites to four sites uh, to incorporate University of Georgia and also NDSU. Uh, each site has its own strength or focus. Um, NDSU has a long history of looking at uh, polymers and coatings. In fact, it is one of the only departments in the United States that has a focus on coatings and paints. And so that's what we're looking on a, a lot here at NDSU, not just that in the area of bioplastics or sustainable materials, but looking at uh, sustainable materials in terms of coatings and paints. And then like Iowa State does a lot of synthesis and thermoplastics. Washington State has a long history of, of composites. University of Georgia has a long history of packaging. And one can imagine what that's important. So, um, it's, it's formation uh, happened and uh, we have member companies. So we get some of our funding from industry, some of our funding from in, uh, the National Science Foundation Center. Uh, and the industry companies are really heavily engaged. They vote on what projects, they determine what projects. Even though I'm the center director, uh, I have no say on what gets funded. They really define what they want to have happen. And each site has a site director. So here at NDSU, as Dean Webster. Um, he's the department chair for the polymers and coatings. Uh, then I'm the site, the center director for, for overseeing and helping administering the four sites, uh, sites to work together as a unit. Mm -hmm. So bioplastics and, and biodegradable, we hear all these terms. Yeah. Uh, you know, let's start with, what does the term biodegradable mean? Well, it depends on who you ask. Um, but there are ASTM standards, American Society of Testing Materials, uh, that clearly define what is uh, biodegradable, and there's a test procedure for testing that. Um, so a lot of times we think of things breaking down like in 45 days uh, in a particular setting. So uh, we have to make sure that we're not just saying something's biodegradable. We have to define what we mean by what are the conditions. Uh, you know, there's anecdotal stories about people finding hot dogs in, uh, you know, compost bins or whatever, you know, that were uh, years old because it didn't break down, the conditions were not right. So you need to write moisture and write humidity for certain things to break down. You know, if it's a petrochemical plastic like this uh, product here that we worked with Ford Motor Company, um, you know, this plastic is not going to break down in, in landfill for many, many thousands of years. Mm -hmm. um, however, in contrast, if we add fillers to it, uh, maybe it will break down. Now, in this case, the, this is a bio-based material, and this is a replacement for that part uh, where we took agave fibers. So we worked with uh, a couple of our member companies, uh, Diageo, who is a large spirit manufacturer, and one of the products they make is agave uh, fibers from when they make tequila. 
And when they're done with that, it's a waste product. Traditionally, they had to pay to get rid of it or burn it. Um, but at one of our meetings, um, the people from uh, uh, Diageo were meeting with Ford and said, hey, what about doing this? And so we, we conducted a project within the center and we figured out a cost-effective way of putting agave fibers, replacing those with glass fibers, uh, so that we have a lighter weight material um, that's partially bio-based, it's not biodegradable, right? I wouldn't want some part of my car being bi biodegradable, <laughs> I don't think. Yeah, exactly. But it is partially bio-based, and so it makes some of the aspects of energy recovery from this a little bit easier. Uh, and then one of our other member companies, Retech, now they're, they're help compounding this material. And so it's a win-win for every, everybody. Diageo gets, uh, gets to up, increase the value of their, what was a vision as a waste stream, is now has value. Ford gets a lighter weight material. Compounders get to make money from doing that. And then also the people who do the injection molding and actually make this component for Ford find it actually takes less energy to make it. And so it's a win-win. In contrast, there are some materials that we do design to be biodegradable. You know, this is a pot project that we conducted um, that uh, was commercialized by one of our member companies um, within CB Squared out of Minneapolis and uh, Self Eco. And you can buy these on Amazon as well as Walmart. And so this is fully bio-based, it's corn and soy, and it was designed to be self-fertilizing. So we knew that the protein from the soy has amino acids that have nitrogen and so it would self-fertilize. So you wouldn't have to add any artificial fertilizer. We also envisioned that it would degrade uh, once it's in the soil. So what we recommend is you once you, as a gardener, you, know, you pop this thing off and then you grab the root ball and you do this to get the root circling to, to, to be broken up a little bit. To our surprise, this did not have any root circling. All the roots were not circling around like this in a traditional pot. They were all pointing outwards and there were more of them. And so it was a much healthier plant. So you don't even have to do that. So you pop the plant off, you crush this because it still has some fertilizing ability to it. Put that in the bottom of the hole, put the plant on top and you're good. And one of the uh, things we found was that you actually get about twice as much fruit off of a plant that's grown in one of these versus a traditional petrochemical pot. We contribute that to the healthier root ball system and hmm. having more root nodules. So this would be something that would degrade in the soil, uh, and this is where we would want it to degrade. Um, and we get into ocean-based plastics. We always uh, are very cautious about saying whether we want to put anything in the ocean. Um, the only thing that should be in there are fish and some mammals and some salt and some plankton and this kind of stuff. There shouldn't be anything like this at all in the ocean. Sure. We've well, got a couple other items here. To... Yeah, so this is uh, another product. This is an OSB board that was manufactured out of a soybean uh, oil. Uh, what happens here, we take the uh, co-product from biodiesel production, which is glycerin, uh, which is, has very little value from the biodiesel industry, and uh, working with like uh, Professors Eric Cochran down at Iowa State, uh, figured out a way to accrelate that and turn that into an adhesive um, that can be used to put together wood panels like this. So it's, it's bio-renewable, uh, has great mechanical properties. So, you know, something that... Uh, is uh, in contrast to a petrochemical. And then we have a little, little bag that we use for promotional that's made out of hemp. You know, with the, uh, the recent um, uh, law changes becoming a lot more use, uh, easy to work in that, in that arena. And so, you know, grocery bags are, you know, reusable bags that, that are made out of, out of renewable feedstock. Mm -hmm. Well, how many people, how many students are involved with this project? So, uh, between the four universities, over 100 faculty that are involved. Um, and, you know, so it's, uh, at any given time, uh, we fund projects for about a year. Uh, projects can last more than a year, but they have to be renewed. Again, looking at making sure that we meet industry uh, requirements, what they're interested in. Uh, so we ask them to be renewed. At any given time, we're probably funding about 20 to 25 students at any given time. Yeah, you know, you, <clears throat> what are plastics made from as it relates to this study? Okay. Traditionally, plastics, you know, are made from petrochemical feedstock. Um, however, in our case, uh, they could be a combination thereof. You know, this is partially based of uh, polyethylene, which is a uh, uh, petrochemical plastic from uh, natural gas, but the agave fibers. So we look at feedstocks that are from uh, co-products like the agave fibers, uh, woody products. Uh, some of the stuff comes from oils like soybean oil or other oils, particularly if it's non-food grade oil. Uh, we also look at uh, different forms of sugars. So, um, you know, starch is a polymerized sugar, and so we can take uh, starches from potatoes or corn um, and, and use those, or we can use the starch directly. Um, we also look at uh, cellulose and hemicellulose materials as well. Um, we also, like I said, look at um, the, the hemp fibers. So it's, it's all of the above, of a, a lot of different materials that we look at as possible feedstocks. Yeah, now, was there an initial study that began past summer, or how, how did all this work? So, you know, NDSU joined um, 
uh, CB squared about a, about six months ago, nine months ago, when we formally started to have our projects. You know, Chad Olvin out of the Department of Mechanical Engineering, he's looking at a project at the uh, uh, outgassing of hemp fibers as for the automotive industry. Um, one of the few things, one of the things that they do not want to have happen is have plastic components put into the car. Um, you know, I'm old enough to remember that uh, when plastics became very prevalent in cars, you'd get this film that would form on the windshield. Very difficult to take off. Everybody had, uh, you know, some type of idea of how to get that film off of there, and that was outgassing of some of the uh, organ volatile organic compounds. Uh, within the plastics, and uh, we don't want to have that happen to make sure that we don't have a repeat of that. So when we put these uh, natural fibers, natural fillers, uh, natural polymers into these components, we want to make sure that we don't have anything like that that would happen that would have uh, an outgassing. Mm -hmm. How far into the future will this study go? So CB Squared, being an IUCRC, uh, runs naturally for about 15 years, being funded by NSF. Uh, there's three phases of, of one, phase one, two, three. Uh, the, during each phase, there's a little bit of a reduction of how much contribution the government pays for this and weaning us off of government funds and putting us more onto industry funds. So at the end of year 15, uh, the plan would be that it would still continue and that we would then be relying primarily on industry funds to continue the projects and continue the, the administrative fees and so on for the, project, the center. And again, what are, what are the long-term benefits you think from this project and, and sort of what do you hope to, will be accomplished by it? Well, I think that, um, you know, as we see more and more bioplastics becoming uh, more prevalent uh, in industry, um, that we're going to help uh, be a catalyst to make sure that that continues to grow. So we're going to be offsetting um, the, the use of petrochemical plastics and becoming more sustainable, using more sustainable materials. And so I think that that's really the long goal, long-term goal, is to at one point be, have materials that are sustainable. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, let's talk, you mentioned welding. Can you talk a little bit, expand on your uh, past yeah. welding career? Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Um, you know, I, I studied under a, a great individual by the name of Bobby Benatar. He, he came out of MIT, and I was very fortunate to have him as a major advisor. Had I not had that, I, I don't think that I, I could have made it through graduate school. And he studied uh, ultrasonic welding of plastics. And where that comes from is, uh, if we think about uh, all the products that we work with on a day-to-day -day basis, a lot of them have welding in applications. Uh, the toothpaste that you brush your teeth with this morning, if it was out of a tube, that little tube was sealed. If you uh, had yogurt this morning, uh, that aluminum foil that has a plastic coating on it, that was ultrasonically welded together. Uh, all your headlights and taillights, that crystal to the housing, are all welded together. And it's actually a very complicated process when you get into it. It was all started back uh, with uh, Albert Einstein's random theory of walk and then uh, Dijon out of France built on that and talked about reptilian diffusion and how these long polymer chains can kind of behave like snakes. Um, and then uh, so we look at how these diffuse and, and migrate across a boundary. So we have two parts, an A and a B. How do we make them become a single component? And so when we look at welding of plastics, um, that, that's what we're looking at is welding and sealing. Packaging is heavily uses it. The automotive industry heavily uses welding of plastics. And it's just putting two parts together. Hmm. With that said, how do you bridge academic learning, uh, you used a little uh, terminology there, uh, with government and industry? Yeah. Um, the biggest thing is to make sure that when we work with industry, we really listen to what they're interested in. Um, you know, we don't want to turn our ears off and just do what we want to do. We need to do what they want to do, right? Um, you don't go to a, a store to buy, to buy something and then walk out with something else. Uh, you go there, you want a return on your investment, and this is what, how you want that return to be made. And so it's very important uh, from an academic point of view to really listen to what industry says, their, what their problem is, and make sure that we address that problem. Okay. Well, you're the chair of the Industrial and Manufacturing Engineering Department mm -hmm. at North Dakota State University. What is industrial engineering? So industrial engineering is, you know, can be defined by a number of different ways. The way I look at it is really is a, it's a very much a systematic approach. It's looking at the whole system uh, from things coming in things going out and everything in between. And how do we optimize the processes? How do we optimize the steps? How do we optimize um, you know, moving things around and the logistics of it? So it's very much an optimization and doing a lot of problem solvings of the whole system. Mm -hmm. And then what is manufacturing engineering? So it's a little bit of a subset of that. So that may be a subset of the industrial manufacturing where we actually uh, figure out how do we make parts? And um, you know, it, it's, it's actually pretty complicated to get into the theory of machining, you get into the theory of welding, 
Uh, you get into the theory of you know CNC and robots and computers. And so we focus a lot on how to manufacture or make a part. And that begins all the way back at the design stage. Um, I always argued with the students to make sure that when they get out in industry, they really work with the designers uh, so that the part is manufacturable. You don't want to have something come to you and be told, okay, now you need to figure out how to make this, and it's totally impossible to make it in a cost-effective way. If you're involved way back in the design state, so that's where we really encourage our manufacturing engineers to get involved way early so that you make sure that the thing that you're going to have to make is makeable. Mm -hmm. Well, with that said, um, you know, well, talk, talk about the NDSU's uh, engineering department, well-known, uh, mm -hmm. and what kind of careers can students expect in, when, when they get through that uh, yeah. program? You know, our students are highly uh, recruited. Um, you know, we have about 1,800 undergraduate students uh, within the College of Engineering. Uh, we have a number of different programs um, and within the college, and our students are, are going out and getting high pay jobs. They're highly recruited. Uh, the starting salaries are very high. Uh, they have a very good uh, trajectory in their incomes. It's, it's very fast. And they go to, to work at people like Ford Motor Company. Uh, they work at Boeing's. They work at Caterpillar. They, they work at Pella Windows. They work at uh, Anderson Windows. You know, they work at a, a lot of different places. They also get jobs uh, where we may not even think of. I have a student right now that's doing a co-op down in Walt Disney. Uh, she's down there uh, doing a co-op on logistics. And so a lot of our students go out and get jobs where we don't necessarily think engineers would land up landing, uh, landing a job. A lot of them land up working at the UPS and working at uh, places uh, that do things of moving things. And one can imagine Amazon on how effective they are at moving things. So, and you know, a lot of our students go off and get jobs at our the member companies within CB Squared, whether that's Ford or Hyundai or 3M or ADM or Sher Sherwin-Williams. Um, you know, all the member companies that we have, there's almost 30 member companies that work for, uh, that we work with within, within CB Square. So, um, but that's, you know, our, our students go out and get jobs all over the world. Yeah. And you mentioned 1,800 students, I think, in the engineering uh, department. That's all of engineering because there's industrial, mechani the mechanical. Mechanical and electrical and civil and construction and, and uh um, and so on. So yeah, we have we have uh, basically you know and also agricultural and biosystems engineering. Yeah. So so there's different different ones, but yours again concentrates on the industry and manufacturing. They're just like yeah. mm -hmm. like yeah. things like this for car parts. Yeah. And the job that I, I was just talking about. I mean, this that's across the, across the whole college, or where our students go and get jobs. I'm not talking specifically about IME. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'd like to really focus on IME, but. It's really about the College of Engineering and, and how heavily recruited our students are. Mm -hmm. Well, can you tell us about when plastics were invented and maybe why they were invented? Yeah, you know, as most inventions were, they were up by accident. Uh, I think that uh, most people would probably uh, indicate that maybe Bakelite was one of the first ones um, back in 1907. Um, and there was commonly used, you know, telephones were made out of Bakelite and Bakelite's still around. Um, so, you know, they took off. Um, and the petrochemical industry had uh, all these co-products they wanted to get rid of. And so they were able to figure out how to use some of their co-products and make plastics. And they're, they're a great material, right? Plastics are great. You go to the, uh, to the uh, grocery store and you get this, this plastic bag and you load it up with all these groceries and it doesn't rip for the most part. The, I mean, plastics are great, right, for health care. Uh, if we didn't have plastics, our health would never be, our health care system would not be where it's at today. If it wasn't for plastics, right, we wouldn't be able to have uh, the electronics industries where it's at. So it's not to say that plastics are bad. We just need to be able to make sure that we're on a sustainable path. Well, they've definitely changed uh, the culture and the, uh, everything about what we do, it seems like. Uh, well, just real briefly here, what, how's the transition been from Iowa State to North Dakota State University? Uh, it's been great. Um, the college, the university has been very, very welcoming, uh, from, the, from the dean to the provost to the president, uh, working heavily with the, uh, the vice president of research, uh, Jane Shu. She's been great to work with. Uh, so it, the transition uh, on that side of it has been, been incredibly easy. Um, it's been exciting. Uh, I was not a department chair at Iowa State, so it's all the excitement of learning a new job and, and figuring out the do's and don'ts and, and, uh, and so on. So that's been great. Uh, I've been very, very blessed to have uh, Beth Dahl be my assistant because without her, I would not be here. Yeah. We're out of time. Uh, if people want more information, where can they go? Well, they can contact me, uh, david.gruel at ndsu.edu. Or they can go to our, our webpage, uh, centers uh, at ndsu.cb2 uh, CB, at uh, ndsu.edu. All right. Thanks for joining us. Thanks today. a lot, John. Appreciate yeah. it. Stay tuned for more.
The John Peterson Jazz Quintet is a top-notch jazz group from the Fargo-Moorhead area. Watch now as they play the classic Autumn Leaves.
Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse this week. And as always, thanks for watching. Funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4th, 2008. And by the members of Prairie Public.